Spirelli Paranormal Investigations, Episode 4, written by Kate Bure, narrated by Roberto Scarlato. Chapter 1 Jack pushed off from the counter and spun his new swivel stool. I don't think you mentioned. Why did you move out of your dad's house? Marin didn't bother to look up. None of your business. Where did you get this crap? We'll never be able to sell this stuff. She pulled out a tangle of colorful plastic beads. Not true. Jack spun around again on his stool. Mardi Gras. That's months away, but you're probably right. These will make great decorations. Or they will after someone untangles them all. And yes, I know that's me. She picked at the knotted mess, glancing periodically at Jack. Finally, she said, Geez, Jack, stop it. You're going to puke. Jack spun the stool one more time, just because. Why not? When the world around him stilled, it occurred to him that maybe, just maybe, Marin had been right. He didn't feel lightheaded, but he was pretty damn sure he was hallucinating. Marin. His gaze remained fixed on the small creature that had appeared in front of him. What? she snapped. Without looking away from it, he asked, Do you see a small, white, furry, uh, something near the office door? Hey, that's exciting. Your hedgehog is coming out to say hello. They're usually so shy. The sound of beads clattering on the table muffled her words. Although you have been feeding him crab meat. Its nose twitched, and its big brown eyes moved from him to Marin and back again. If Jack didn't know better, he'd swear the thing smiled when Marin mentioned crab. Jack sat as still as he could manage. That is not a hedgehog. It looked more like a lab puppy than a hedgehog, but definitely not a puppy. It had no tail, a round body with short, stubby legs, and large brown eyes. It was the big brown mournful eyes that reminded him of a puppy. He won't disappear if you blink, Jack. Obviously, he wants something. In response, the furry creature dropped back on its haunches into a position that resembled a dog sitting. See? He's even getting comfortable. Marin's voice was getting closer. It lay down. Uh, I think... This sounds nuts. But I think he understands you. Jack would swear the creature sighed. He definitely understands. Jack, meet your Ark and Sonny, Marin said. Sir, may I present Jack Spirelli, as you know, the proprietor of the shop. I'm Marin Campbell. It's a privilege to meet you. The little furry creature stood back up on his four legs and executed what looked to Jack like a very credible bow. Jack wasn't sure what he was supposed to say. Hi? Marin poked him in the ribs with an elbow. A thank you wouldn't hurt. This gentleman is the reason your shop is doing so well. Rubbing his side, Jack said, Thank you. He shot Marin a hard look. He moved out of poking range, then said, I'm not exactly sure what I'm thanking you for, but I have enjoyed having you here. You're good company. Jack couldn't look the little creature in the face as he added that last sentiment. It was a little embarrassing. He says you're good company too, and the food's good. Jack shifted his gaze to Marin. He's communicating with you? I don't hear anything. He can communicate telepathically. Marin tilted her head, studying their new friend. I didn't know that. Can I ask why you didn't speak before now? A slow smile spread across Marin's face, and she nodded. Jack sighed. This was going to get old fast. Maybe you could share, since I can't hear him? Fuzzface. Marin's grin reappeared. Bob didn't have anything to say before. Bob? Marin crossed her arms. Bob. Awkward. 
Jack had given the dude a pet name because he thought he was a rodent of some kind. But Bob? Bob, uh, apologies for the nicknames. I didn't really know what to call you. When Fuzzface dipped his head, Jack said, Any chance of you speaking to me? Fuzzface's, Bob's, furry head turned to Marin. He is. Marin opened her eyes wide, giving Jack an innocent look. Bob's a guy of few words. I think he can communicate with me because we both have the ability. You're probably out of luck, and I don't think Bob sees any problem with me acting as translator. Bob blinked his big eyes at Jack. He seemed to be waiting. So, uh, I'm glad to meet you. Jack rubbed his neck. This one-way conversation thing was going to kill him. What did the little guy want? Thanks for the crab. I like shrimp, too. Marin's lips pulled into a smile as she translated. Ark and Sunny are really good luck. Those mysterious items that always seem to show up when a customer asks, those great finds you've stumbled across at garage sales when you're just picking up random boxes of leftovers. Marin pointed to Bob. Seriously? Jack whispered to Marin. When she just raised her eyebrows and nodded, he turned back to Bob and the fuzzy little body that housed some serious, raw, magical talent. I had no idea. And, um, sure, shrimp's no problem. I mean, if you have a list... Jack looked to see what Marin was getting in response. She gave a subtle shake of her head. Or, you know, crab and shrimp are great. Jack had experienced some weirdness in the last few months, but this was beyond bizarre. Roll with it, Jack. I can buy crab and shrimp. Is there anything else? My friend, sorry, Bob's friend, needs help. Marin frowned. Let me close the shop, and we can talk about this in the office without being interrupted. Bob must have thought that was a grand idea, because he trotted off in the direction of the shop. Jack watched a tiny corkscrew tail disappear into the office, and then he turned to Marin. How have you not mentioned this to me before? Marin flipped the sign to closed and shot the bolt. Yeah, that's tricky. They're really shy, and they usually work in secret. Honestly, I thought he might leave if I told you. Or if you made a big fuss about him. I don't know, maybe I was wrong. So, you do realize that he's hiring us, right? Jack exhaled a loud breath. Sure, right, okay. I think Bob's probably a pretty good guy. I have a good feeling about this one. When they walked into the office, they found Bob curled comfortably in one of the client chairs. So what can we do for you? Jack asked. Chapter 2 Jack's radar was clearly off. Any good feelings about Bob's case he might have imagined had vanished as soon as he'd learned more. Come to find out, Ark and Sonny were communication minimalists. Not much for chit-chat, generally, and danger didn't seem to make them any more talkative. At least not their buddy, Bob. Something nasty in the attic. That was the message Jack and Marin had gotten out of Bob. He'd provided a few additional details a location down the street from the shop, that the shop was his Arcan Sunny buddy's crash pad, and repeated his thanks for the crab. Then he disappeared. Sneaky fast? Temporarily invisible? Teleportation? Jack wasn't placing bets. An hour ago, he hadn't even known there was such a thing as an Arcan Sunny. As he and Marin approached their destination, a charity thrift shop, Jack couldn't help but be thankful. At least the something nasty wasn't in his attic. Turn air. Jack pointed to the right. Marin slowed down, but didn't put her blinker on. Turn right. That parking lot right there. Marin ignored him, then sped up and passed the small charity shop parking lot. Shit. The color had washed from Marin's face. Shit, shit, shit. Okay, you're freaking me out a little. What's the problem? 
Marin looked at Jack, her eyes huge. I am in so much trouble. Her fingers flexed around the steering wheel, and Jack could see her pulse leaping in her throat. We are in so much trouble. Jack decided it was time for him to assume a role that was somewhat foreign in their relationship. Level-headed sidekick. Explain to me exactly what the problem is, and we'll deal with it. Marin shook her head. Just let me get us out of here before he realizes I'm here. Not the shop. Too close. Your place? Okay. Turn right at the next light. Jack had a sick feeling that he, whoever he was, was a scary son of a bitch. Because Marin was terrified. It took 15 minutes to reach Jack's house, and in that time he could see Marin ease out of her terror. By the time she turned into his driveway, she looked almost calm. As she drove up the winding drive, her eyebrows climbed. Seriously? What? Jack tried to keep a scowl off his face. He hated explaining his personal life. That shit was nobody's business. First, not what I imagined. Second, I clearly need a raise. This place predates Spy and the junk shop. Since I'm hustling to make my property tax payments, no. You cannot have a raise. Jack pointed to a spot where she could park. Why don't you sell? A small acreage like this, right in Austin. It hasn't always been in Austin, Jack said, and I bought the place with some money my grandmother left me. I can't just sell it. Marin pulled the key out of the ignition and then slowly turned to face him. Are you telling me you're keeping the property for sentimental reasons? Jack didn't reply. Didn't even look at her. Oh my god, Marin said. This is why you're such an asshole about money. He wanted to thump her. But why bother when he had a legitimate reason to pry into her personal shit? Why were you so worried at the charity shop? And who is the he you're so concerned about running into? Oh, Jack. Marin collapsed back into her seat. I seriously screwed up. I'm talking big, huge, massive screw-up. Glad it's not me for a change. But what exactly did you do? I think maybe I let an ancient, exiled dragon back into the world. Marin winced. She shut her eyes and sighed. Pretty sure I did, actually, unless there's another dragon in Austin, or someone with dimension-hopping abilities. And it's living in the attic of a charity shop? Jack shook his head. Never mind. How did you do that exactly? You remember how I hopped through wards? Non-physical anchor here in this reality and the physical part of me in another place? Jack couldn't forget if he tried. When Marin had pulled both him and their client through that doorway on a previous case, the sensation hadn't been one he'd ever wanted to repeat. He still didn't understand exactly where they'd gone. It had been cold and empty. He'd felt transparent. No, he'd felt hollow. Actually, he wasn't sure how he'd felt. His body hadn't worked like it should in that space, but he'd have peed himself if it had. Yeah. I opened that door when we were at the airport trying to get Sylvia out of town, but I opened it really wide. I thought that might fry the lights for just a moment. Oh yeah, I remember that. I meant to ask you how you did that. You're telling me that you shorted out the airport lights by opening up a huge interdimensional doorway? Jack tamped down his incredulity. He did stupid shit, but that was epic. That's... asinine. I know that now. Marin scrunched up her face. In the moment, it seemed like a good idea. I was going to say creative. But if you let something nasty through the door then maybe asinine is more accurate. Why didn't you say something? Marin choked. You think I knew the essence of some ancient and probably batshit crazy dragon snuck through? I didn't know other dragons could even do that. I thought my door worked for me. You know, that only I knew it was there. 
She frowned at the look on Jack's face. There's no handbook, Jack, and it hasn't come up before. Well, okay. Let's think about this. If it's just his essence, he can't really do anything, can he? Who knows what he can do? I don't think something like this has ever happened. He's from the time before. Before what? Jack asked. I told you, remember? Dragons made a choice to live in the now, in this culture. He's from before. He made the choice to leave. Jack had a nasty feeling in his gut. Please tell me that our dragon visitor hasn't been living in that dimensional pit stop of nothingness for centuries. Marin shrugged and gave him an uncertain look. Maybe? Or maybe my hidey hole has doorways to other places. I don't know. Oh, my God. The color fled her face. I have to tell my dad. She covered her face, her words muffled. And I have to tell Lachlan. I don't suppose we can fix this on our own? No, Marin groaned. This is the kind of mistake staying close to the clan is supposed to prevent. Jack didn't know what arrangement she'd made with her dad and Lachlan, only that they weren't thrilled about her leaving the nest so young, especially her dad. Will you have to go back to the clan? She shrugged. I won't go. Anyway, we have bigger concerns. After debating with himself for several seconds, the only certain conclusion he drew was that being the reasonable one on the team wasn't all that much better than being the guy blundering along with not much of a clue. Attempting a confidence he didn't feel, he said, Here's what we're going to do. You're going to call your dad. Better now than after something worse has happened. And you never know. He might have an easy fix, or tell you it's less of a problem than you think. You didn't feel him in your head. It's a big deal. He's really old. But Marin grabbed her phone. Hang on. Jack opened the car door. I'm not staying for this conversation. I'm going inside to call Harrington. He needs to know there's a potential threat in Austin. Jack held up his hand when Marin started to protest. Dragon business or not, IPPC and Harrington are the only thing remotely resembling law enforcement or a magical infrastructure that we have in the U.S. He needs to know. And when we're done, we're heading back to the shop. We can't avoid the place. And it can't be a coincidence that this evil essence is squatting so close to the shop. It's me. It has to be. I'm the only dragon for miles. And I've been practically living at the junk shop lately, dealing with all the new stock you've been digging up and reorganizing Spy's client files. If he's drawn to you, then we can't avoid him. And better he stay in one predictable place, right? Sure. Marin stared out the front windshield, then nodded once more. All right. Let me do this before I have a coronary. As Jack let himself in through the side door, he couldn't help wonder how bad the situation was. He'd never seen Marin so rattled, or act so much like the 21-year-old human girl she was supposedly equivalent in age to. He headed for the kitchen. After his meeting that morning with Bob, he wasn't about to run out of crab at the junk shop. He was already here, and anything that dropped a few more bucks into his bank account was a priority. And, he had to admit, having Bob in the shop, even before he knew his unseen companion was Bob, had been... nice. He liked leaving food for him. He dialed Harrington as he started poking around in his pantry for canned crab. He'd just found three cans hidden behind a bag of basmati rice when the call rolled to voicemail. Jack couldn't remember ever having gotten Harrington's voicemail before. The guy must sleep with his phone attached to his body, because he always answered. Except for now. Shit. Jack Spirelli here. There's an emergency in Austin. Call me back, or check in with Ewan for details. Marin should be updating him now. And Jack ended the call. Harrington might be curious enough as to why the IPPC library's head of security was involved 
that he'd move following up on Jack's phone call to the top of his lengthy to-do list. Or it was already at the top of his list and enough of an emergency that even Harrington was ruffled. Shit. Jack grabbed the crab and booked it back to Marin's truck. He slowed as a terrible sense of foreboding washed over him. He'd never in his life felt prescient, but he knew with complete certainty that something horrible was about to happen. Jack! Marin called from the truck. We need to go. Now! Move it! Indecision held him locked in place. A heavy weight settled over him, pulled him down. He was suddenly so incredibly tired. Jack! Marin appeared from nowhere and tugged on his arm, urging him to the truck. Come on, let's go! What you feel, it's not real! He didn't care. Whether it was real or imagined, it felt real. He was so tired, and his skin hurt when he moved. Ow! A moment of clarity followed a sharp pinch to his arm. Yeah, Marin said. Sorry, move your feet, or I'm picking you up. Don't. The feel of her hand on his shoulder, firmly urging him forward, felt foreign. The contact unpleasant on his hypersensitive skin. His joints ached with each step he struggled to take. Marin opened the passenger door and shoved him into the seat. He opened his eyes, unsure how long they'd been closed. Landscape passed by, the colors bleeding together. Buildings, trees, and sky all blurred. Grays, greens, blues. That wasn't right. Blue. He focused on the blue. The sky. Joy. So sharp it stung. His eyes burned with the beauty of the sky. Jack, talk to me. What's going on? Jack opened his mouth, moved his lips, but his tongue was thick in his too small mouth, and no words came. He could feel the cool air on his wet cheeks. I'm driving as fast as I can. Just hang on. More time passed, but the images that fled by his window were too much, the colors too bright, the emotions too full. Better not to see or hear. Better not to be. Jack stretched his neck. He felt like he'd just gone on a bender and forgotten to chug his regular bottle of water and three ibuprofen before he went to bed. Hey! Marin waved a hand in front of his face. What the hell? Quit it! He shoved her hand away. Why are we in your car? He looked out the window, but he didn't recognize the gas station where they were parked. Where are we? Waco. Over an hour from Austin. More than an hour had passed since he'd been cognizant of his surroundings. Jeez, my entire body hurts. Did you beat the crap out of me when I wasn't looking? Jack opened the car door. I've got to stretch my legs. Marin hopped out and followed him. What do you remember? Jack rubbed at his eyes. They had a gritty, dry feel that was familiar. Please tell me I didn't sit in the car and cry myself to sleep. Yeah, not exactly. Jack stopped and turned to face her. I was kidding. What do you mean, not exactly? But before she could answer, he remembered seeing the sky and the lightning strike of emotion that had followed. Wait. Old crazy dragon. My house. Then weird shit started to happen. I'm not sure how, but this dragon's essence seems to have telepathic abilities. Jack looked around the parking lot. No passers-by looked like they were eavesdropping. So he used telepathy to make me cry and feel like I'd been beaten by a baseball bat? That's not how telepathy works. Not usually. Marin dipped her head closer. We use it to mind-speak primarily with each other and sometimes with people. Oh, I won't forget you yelling in my head, but that's not what this was. Not even remotely. Marin cocked her head. 
You remember? No, at least not exactly. It's like an old memory, or a dream. You know, the scenes and feelings were vivid when they originally happened, even though you can't pull up a good, solid image. A memory of clarity, but no actual, clear pictures. I wasn't sure I could outrun him. Marin looked at a point just over his shoulder. So I tried extending the veil I'd created to protect myself to include you. Seriously? You're trying out shit you don't know how to do on me? Again? Would you rather we still be driving north? Because I'm not sure we could outrun him. He doesn't have a physical form. If that's true, why is he not playing his weird mind games on me now? Jack surveyed the parking lot again. His scalp crawled as he realized that the entity could be within feet of him, invisible to human eyes. He's not here. He's retreated. I'm guessing to the charity shop. So your veil worked? Yeah, Marin said, and is still working. Jack locked his fingers behind his neck. Are you telling me I'm tethered to you until we sort this guy out? You're welcome. It wasn't an inconvenience at all to exercise the demon mucking about in your head. Marin took an audible breath. In a much calmer voice, she said, Look, I know this is my fault. I'm sorry. Yeah. Having someone screw around inside my brain, well, it hasn't improved my mood. But thanks for the mental delousing. Truly. Jack did his very best to look sincere. What's the distance on this veil that's protecting me? Marin shrugged. Like he thought, he was tethered to Marin for the foreseeable future. Are we safe to head back if you keep the veil up? Yes, Marin frowned. Don't look at me that way. I'm sure. The tricky part was extending it to include you. But now that's been done, it's all good. Jack knew there was something she wasn't telling him. But as he climbed back into the truck, he decided he was too damn tired to worry about it. His last thought as he leaned his head back was that maybe her father had provided some useful information. Chapter 3 Jack awoke with a jerk, the feeling of wind against his skin fading completely as his eyes opened. A sense of exhilaration slipped away as the world around him came into focus. He was still in the truck with Marin, but he recognized Austin in the muted light of dusk. He scrubbed his face with his hands. What's the plan? Marin didn't immediately answer, and as she continued to drive, Jack recognized the route they were taking. The junk shop? We're headed to the charity shop. I'd drop you off, but that leaves you unprotected, and there's no telling if he'll try to attack you again. Jack shifted uncomfortably in his seat. Had he been attacked? Jeez, that thing had scrambled his brains. It had gotten inside his head. It had more than attacked Jack. It had penetrated the deepest parts of his mind. Wait, we're going to the charity shop? Where that thing lives? Marin nodded, her eyes still on the road ahead. Please tell me you have a plan. She tipped her head to the side. Yes. A not shitty plan? Silence followed Jack's question. Essence of dragon. Not a physical presence. It couldn't hurt him. Just like the dark couldn't hurt him, and there were no monsters under his bed. He puffed out an annoyed breath. Unfortunately, drawing a conclusion with limited facts didn't make it true. Now or when he was a kid. We need a name for this thing, Jack said. Unnamed nasty thing in the charity shop attic just makes him seem creepier. And it's too long. Without hesitation, Marin said, Joshua. Joshua? Any particular reason? Marin glanced at him, a smile tugging at the corner of her lips. Does Joshua strike terror in the hearts of his enemies? Jack choked back a laugh. 
<laughs> Sold. I'm going to open a small dimensional door in the attic. Not like at the airport. Just a small opening, as if I was ward hopping. And then? Marin uncurled her clenched fingers from the steering wheel. Then I leave it open, and we hope that Joshua came here in error, or at least that he wants to return to his body as much as we want him to leave. You think he can't work magic in the state he's in? I have no idea. Her forehead wrinkled as her eyes narrowed. Even Dad and Lachlan don't know. There's no experience within our clan of a dragon who has sustained separation from his physical body as long as Joshua has. And that's assuming it's just been since the airport incident. For all we know, it's been much longer. A dragon's essence, his anchor, isn't intended to function independently for long. Marin frowned. The separation is uncomfortable, and I can't imagine that discomfort lessens with time. You think his body is sitting in that way station place? Jack tamped down a surge of panicky claustrophobia. That closed-in, suffocating feeling was followed by a pang of sympathy for Joshua. His skin prickled, chilled by the mere thought of that place. Doesn't it hurt you to go there? You mean my hidey hole? No. I wouldn't want a vacation there, but it's not unpleasant in any way. Jack looked out the window. Almost dark. Almost there. It was cold, and I had no sense of time. I couldn't tell if a second or an hour had passed. It's not like that for me. It's just a place. Marin gave him a probing look, but she kept her thoughts to herself. If Joshua can use telepathy, even in a bastardized form you don't recognize, shouldn't he be able to open his own door? Marin tapped her thumb on the steering wheel. If that's the case, this won't work. But telepathy isn't magic. I think it's more of a mental skill. Let's hope he has no magical abilities. And on that less than optimistic note, they arrived at the charity shop. Jack flinched at the sense of foreboding opening the car door seemed to trigger. Were those his own feelings? Or one of Joshua's mind tricks? He hovered near the truck, door still open. He couldn't walk in there without knowing if his mind was his own. Your veil is intact? Jack asked. It is. Can you feel him? Jack considered the question. Did he sense an individual behind the dark cloud that pushed against him? I don't have any sense of intent or personality. What I know for sure is that I'm afraid. The creepy feeling that some people get from dragons, take that and magnify it. Then you get what most people experience around a really old dragon. So if you have a strong urge to pee yourself or run away, that's not mind control, telepathy or anything other than being in the presence of an incredibly old dragon. Marin raised her eyebrows. The good news? That black cloud-looming feeling means he's here. Fear he could handle. Possession of his mind? No. But Marin had him covered with her protective veil, so whatever happened, he would remain himself. Let's do this. A couple walked by and entered the shop. Ah, did you check the business hours? Easier to get in if they're open. For you, anyway. Since Marin actually cared about civilian casualties, he was working on the assumption that she had a plan where he followed her into the store. A curved hip pressed into Jack's groin. Be still, he whispered into Marin's ear. Not much room to move, and it's hot. You're not helping. And what did you expect? It's a freaking closet. The pall that Joshua's presence cast wasn't helping Jack's mood, and from the bits of conversation they'd overheard as the store employees closed up, that pall had probably been felt by at least two former store employees. One had been institutionalized for a sudden psychotic break only two days prior. The other had become violent, and attacked a customer. Marin went completely still. 
I think they're gone. She waited another minute, and then opened the door. Looks like everyone's gone. Jack shoved her out of the closet and followed on her heels. Why don't people avoid this place? Can't they feel it? He rolled his shoulders and neck, trying to loosen the stiffness a half hour of restricted movement had caused. He hadn't wiggled his ass every few seconds. Hmm, you'd be surprised. A lot of humans don't sense anything, and some who do recognize an uncomfortable feeling discount it until it fades into the background. She eyed him like a lab specimen. Humans are weird. Well, those are both better options than beating the crap out of a guy for not having correct change. Prolonged exposure must have triggered those two employees' problems. I really don't understand why they don't walk away if they do feel something. Jack shook his head. Any ideas on attic access? They headed to the stairs labeled Employees Only. No, but I'm guessing there's a pull-down ladder from the ceiling someplace. Once she'd reached the top of the stairs, Marin pointed to the right. You check over there, and I'll catch the other side. Theoretically, if Joshua can still do magic with only his anchor in this dimension, what exactly could he do? Jack said over his shoulder as he headed down the hallway. Marin's voice followed Jack into the room he was checking. The regular stuff. Sense magic, throw fire, and he's probably got some superpowers related to his age. Ha! Got it! Red and blue lights flashed as a cruiser sped down the road. Jack hurried into the room where Marin had found the attic access. She'd already pulled the ladder down from the ceiling. Don't suppose you have a contingency plan if someone calls the police? Jack asked. Do you? Marin quirked an eyebrow at him. When he didn't reply, she started up the ladder. Jack hesitated. There was a reason children feared the monster under their bed and the darkness. It was a visceral response to predators and the unknown, and it seemed like common sense to him. Marin reached the top. Jack stood with one foot on the bottom rung. Climb the stairs or not. Face the beast or run. But it wasn't a choice. Not really. Jack started to climb the stairs. When he reached the top and climbed into the dusty and unused space, there was nothing. The black cloud of malevolence he'd expected to find wasn't there. The same sense of foreboding persisted. But that was all. Is he even here? Oh, yes. A look of concentration passed across Marin's face. The door is open. Now we wait. Okay, but I don't... Jack fell to his knees. Searing pain enveloped him. The protective veil peeled away from his body, leaving what felt like a weeping wound. He braced himself against the floor. If a soul could rip... It must feel like this. But then, howling rage, despair, betrayal. Jack could do nothing but feel, bombarded by waves of emotions. He curled into a ball, trying, failing, to protect himself. He tried to separate out the two pieces winding together. Him, another. Jack, Joshua. Two, not one. He was himself and no one else. Himself. One. Pain turned hollow. His body was numb. And then the world was a silent wash of gray. Jack shifted his head and groaned. Cool fingers stroked his temple. Jack? Marin's voice, but small and uncertain, so unlike her. Ugh, shit. Jack tried to sit up and failed. Holy hell, my head hurts. Marin half giggled, half sobbed, completely unlike her. Jack craned his neck to look at her and winced when the throbbing exploded into pounding. You weren't possessed? No, just scared shitless. Can you get up? The cadence of her voice was all wrong. Thready. Panicked. Mm. 
he struggled to a sitting position, and from there, Marin lifted him to his feet. When the room stopped spinning and his vision cleared, Jack understood. He's still here. The pinched look on Marin's face tightened even more. She gave him a supporting arm to the ladder, then said, I'll go first. Let me get halfway down and then follow. I won't let you fall. Leaving sounded like an excellent plan. As Jack carefully placed one foot after the other, he focused on one thought. One more step. By the time his feet hit the ground, he thought he was going to puke from the pain in his head. That one thought changed to walk. Then his focus shifted to not puking, and that was how he made it to the car. One thought, one goal, and always moving forward. Sitting in the buttery soft leather seats of Marin's truck, Jack was seconds away from passing out. One thought, one goal. Stay awake. One thought, one goal. He had a message. Help me. I know, buddy. I'm working on it, Marin said. Jack could feel the acceleration of the car. Help me. Chapter 4 Jack woke up in someone's bed. Not his. It happened sometimes, sure, but he hadn't been on a date the night before, and he felt like shit. If he'd crashed at some woman's house, he shouldn't feel quite this bad. He rubbed his eyes and frowned. Help me. Hey! Marin poked her head into the room. You're awake. Hmm? Yeah. We're at your house? The door flew open and Lacklin, the McClellan clan's supreme leader, walked in. Jack had only met the man briefly once before, but he was a memorable guy. He was surprised. He'd expected Marin's father, Ewan. Help. You don't look like you need any help. Get your ass out of bed and come down to breakfast. The giant of a man turned and left once he'd made his pronouncement. Welcome to Shea Campbell. I'd apologize, but really, if I started, I'd never be able to stop. Weirdly, human women find him very attractive. He got in late last night. He chartered a flight, what with all of the dragon drama brewing. Marin managed a weak smile. You're okay? Yeah. Sore, but otherwise fine. I passed out? More like fell into an exhausted sleep. You mumbled a few times that you needed help, then you conked out. I woke you up a few times and you seemed coherent, so Lacklin and I decided to let you sleep it off. I don't remember waking up. Or how I got in bed. Jack scanned the room for some sign of clothes. Any chance you've got my clothes stashed somewhere? In the bathroom, with some fresh towels. I threw everything in the wash last night. She was turning to go when Jack remembered. Hey, help me. That wasn't me. That was a message from Joshua. Jack rubbed his temple. I think it was a message. Marin stilled. More than a simple cessation of movement, there was an intensity to the stillness that had Jack on edge. He felt like the stalked sparrow as a house cat ready to pounce. She pivoted toward him, and the moment passed. You're certain he spoke to you? No. Marin held up a hand to stop him from explaining. Get dressed and come down for some breakfast. You can update us both at the same time. About twenty minutes later, Jack was feeling much refreshed after a shower and a shave. He followed the smells of cooking food down the stairs and into the kitchen. Tell us about this message the ancient left with you. Lacklin passed Jack a plate of sausage and bacon once he was seated. Morning, Lacklin, Jack replied. Jack had racked his brain while he'd showered, and he couldn't ever remember words being spoken. He never actually said the words, but I had this really strong sense of a message. Help me. Which makes no sense, I know. Marin blinked and Lacklin raised his eyebrows. I mean, 
he'd just say, help me, if that was what he meant, right? Jack looked between the two dragons. In which language would you expect an ancient to speak when addressing a modern man? Lacklin's expression betrayed no censure. Latin? Jack asked. Or Gaelic? Aren't you guys all originally from Scotland? Lacklin chuckled. All dragons are not originally from Scotland, but I appreciate the sentiment. Are you trying to tell me he was speaking to me in some weird dragon way? Two heads nodded. And that's problematic for a few reasons. Lacklin wiped his mouth with a napkin and leaned back in his chair with hands clasped over his stomach. An ancient has requested aid. It would be immoral and irresponsible to ignore his request. Jack chewed and swallowed his scrambled eggs. Light, fluffy, fabulous eggs. Even if the request is unreasonable? What does that even mean? Help me. As dragons age, Marin said, they lose touch with the now. Time moves differently. What she's saying is that old dragons are usually insane. She's just trying to be respectful, given my advanced years. There was a twinkle in Lacklin's eye as he spoke. Fear of aging and insanity seemed to have no hold over the man sitting in front of Jack. If Joshua has the ability to imprint speech on you, especially a request for help, he's not crazy. Marin lifted the coffee pot. A silent question. Jack shook his head. If this ancient is as old as Marin believes, Lacklin said, if he's from the time before, and he's sane enough to retain the concept of communication with humans, that has immense significance for our people. We need to figure out how to speak with him, help him with his problem, and make sure he doesn't get hurt in the process. As Jack summarized what seemed like impossible and conflicting goals, something else occurred to him. And Joshua is seriously angry. That's my fault, Marin said. When I opened the dimensional door, I invited him to leave. Lacklin thinks that whatever Joshua wants, it's here in this world. So we got angry when we asked him to leave. If you used your non-physical essence to anchor your physical bodies to this world... Jack stopped when he saw Lacklin give Marin a censorious look. Go on, Lacklin urged. Well, Jack continued, how did Joshua's essence end up here without a body? And where is his body? We don't know, but those are questions we'd very much like answered. Lacklin gave Jack a probing look. Jack stopped chewing. Mouthful of sausage, he said. What? Lacklin thinks that there's something about you that attracts Joshua, besides your proximity to me. The subtle emphasis on Lacklin's name made Marin's descent clear. She wasn't on board with whatever he was proposing. Even if it is proximity and psychic vulnerability, the Ancient has made contact twice now with Jack, and Jack's no worse off. They have a connection. Lacklin crossed his arms across his chest, his massive chest. You want me to ask those questions? You do realize I become, quite literally, mentally unhinged every time Joshua touches my mind. But with my help, you won't, Lacklin replied. Marin pushed away from the table. What Lacklin means is that he'll help you connect with Joshua in a safe way that allows you to communicate with him. Why don't one of you speak with him directly? That made so much more sense. And Jack was very attached to his sanity. He wasn't keen to lose it conversing with an ancient, moody dragon, one whose motives were highly suspect. I told Lacklin how Joshua ripped through the veil I'd wrapped around you. He's certain he could just as easily have shredded the protection I'd created for myself, implying he wanted to specifically communicate with you. And that was what happened when you missed half of the strategy talks. You got the shit job. 
if only Jack had known what was happening as he slept. That massive, pulsing ball of anger and regret and loneliness wanted to have a sit-down with him. Why me? Jack asked. I have no idea, but the opportunity to speak with an ancient was previously unimaginable. I'll try to make a connection, but if I fail, it's imperative someone speak with him. Lacklin must have sensed weakness, because he pushed his advantage. If we don't discover what the ancient needs from us, he won't leave. Jack looked at the remainder of his eggs, now cold, and placed his cutlery across the plate. He knew Joshua was in terrible pain. He knew that with more certainty than he knew his own feelings. Something inside him said it was the right thing to do. He'd like to smack that something upside the head. Here was another obnoxious thought. Could he live with himself if he didn't do it? Finally, Jack said, You'll owe me a favor. Lacklin grinned. I certainly will. After some discussion, they decided that waiting until the evening wasn't wise, especially since Joshua had already been successfully lured away from the shop, however unintentionally. Jack proposed the junk shop. Using either of their homes was out of the question, and a public space meant uncontrollable variables. We have to swing by first. Do some prep at the shop, Jack said. Marin did a poor job of suppressing a smile. Jack has an arcane sunny living at the shop. Interesting. I've only met a few. They don't usually choose to inhabit dragon establishments. Lacklin cocked his head thoughtfully. Maybe I'll get a chance to meet him. About an hour later, when Jack unlocked the shop door, Bob was waiting patiently just a few feet away. Had he intuited that Jack needed to speak with him? That was just too much for Jack to consider in this particular moment. The idea of telepathy was difficult enough to handle, but if precognition was also on the table, then his brain might implode. Hi, Bob. Before Jack could explain that he was evicting him temporarily, Bob scampered away. Jack trailed behind him all the way to the office. As he entered his office, he heard the front door bells and turned around to make sure it was only Marin and Lacklin, delayed by the increasingly limited parking in the area. In the office, he hollered over his shoulder. By the time his attention returned to Bob, there were two of them. Bob blinked liquid brown eyes at him. Are you trying to act innocent, Bob? If Bob had eyelashes, he'd be batting them, Jack was certain. As it was, he just gazed soulfully at Jack. This is your buddy from the charity shop? Bob dipped his head. That's cool that you invited him. It's just that we're about to have the nasty visitor from the charity shop come over here. Jack couldn't believe he was having this conversation. Marin walked up behind him. Uh-oh. Yeah. Turning from Marin back to his guests, Jack asked, Would you guys like to stay at my house? Just for a little while. It should be okay to come back here soon. Addressing Bob's friend, Jack added, We're working hard to get Joshua, the dragon in your attic, to move out. I'll be damned, Lacklin murmured as he approached. Nelson is certain that's not the dragon's name. He must be able to communicate with him. Turning his attention to the two Arcan Sunny, Lacklin bowed and said, Apologies. Lacklin McClellan, at your service. Bob's friend was looking a little nervy, and Jack could hardly blame him. He'd been living in the shadow of an ancient dragon for at least several days, maybe longer. No surprise two showing up in close quarters concerned him, but when Lacklin introduced himself, both Arcan Sunny bowed. Ah, Nelson? Bob's friend dipped his head. Nice to meet you, Nelson. Will my house do for a little while? Jack asked again. Two heads bobbed in unison. Do you need a lift? 
Jack winced. Did they teleport? Use public transit? Have some other mode of transport unique to Arcan Sunny? They've declined your generous offer, Marin said. Before Jack could pose any more awkward questions, they were gone. Don't suppose you have a clue how they do that? Or how they're getting to my house? Marin shook her head. I'm not sure how they even know where I live. Lackland snorted. Even if we did chase them off, for a brief time, you had two Arcane Sunny in your shop. It should be raining gold in here, and such compelling creatures. I do wish they had more of a fondness for dragons. Bob's excellent company. Tidy, doesn't talk much, and makes the place feel lived in. Marin snorted. You thought he was a rat up until yesterday. Not true. I thought he was something rodent-like that wasn't a rat. Jack rubbed his neck. I guess there's no reason to delay now. No, it's time. Blacklin quirked an eyebrow. Who's driving? Marin held up her keys. Just on the off chance something goes awry and Jack passes out again. Let's do this. As Jack walked the block and a half to Marin's car, he decided he really should have negotiated a better fee. An undefined dragon favor and a flat fee and a bonus if no one died. He'd really dropped the ball this time. Shit. He didn't want Joshua screwing with his head again. Too soon they arrived at Marin's car. The drive seemed even shorter this time, but it was long enough for Jack to feel fear and doubt. Maybe some regret. Definitely disappointment that he hadn't negotiated a better fee. When Marin turned on to the charity shop street, Jack could feel echoes of Joshua's emotions. He thought they were echoes. Or Joshua was there in his mind already. The line between memory and reality wavered. Jack rolled his shoulders. He could do this. Should we have practiced backstopping your psychic defenses and enhancing your telepathic abilities? Lackland said. I don't see why. I'm doing the heavy lifting, and I don't need the practice. Of course you don't. Jack massaged his temple with his thumb. Lacklin was giving him a headache. Remembering how badly his head hurt the last two times he'd encountered Joshua made it ache even more. He'd almost prefer a solid whack on the head. Don't suppose anyone knows what kind of long-term damage this stuff is doing to my brain? Neither Marin nor Lacklin replied. Marin slowed down as they passed the charity shop and said, Last time, it took a few miles before I noticed Jack was affected. Granted, I was a little distracted. The idea of an old dragon, some guilt over the doorway, concern about Dad kicking my butt. I had a few things on my mind. Does it feel like the sky is about to fall? Or is that a human reaction? Jack asked, more to distract himself from the intense feelings of foreboding than actual curiosity. Marin caught his gaze in the rearview mirror. Completely human, chicken little. Lacklin seemed to consider the question, and he didn't answer for several seconds. To me, it's a deep knowledge, a well that has no bottom. A chill crawled up Jack's spine. That, too. He felt it now. He knows we're here. There's no doubt. Lacklin leaned back in the passenger seat and closed his eyes. There was no wall around him, no force field, nothing that Jack could in any way perceive. But he knew it was there, because this time it was different. This time, Jack was a visitor, not the conduit for Joshua's emotions. He was on a train that traveled through a barren landscape. But there was no train just the sensation of gently rolling, of forward progress. And there was no landscape, just the desolation of a life lived too long alone. Jack was floating. No body tied him to the earth. He wanted to ask where his body was, but the words weren't there. Something pulled him, reeling him back to the ground. 
Lachlan. Jack knew there were questions to ask, but he couldn't remember them. He was back on the train, but the world around him moved with urgency now. Wind whipped his hair, cold chilled his limbs, silence pounded into his eardrums, and he felt liquid trickle from his ears. Again, he was pulled away. The landscape changed again. The washed-out tones and gray became a thick, sucking, pulling black. A black so deep it consumed what it touched. Jack snatched his hands away, and Lachlan's tether held tight. The rolling motion stopped. The sensation of the train, of solid space, fell away. And then Jack fell, and he kept falling, falling, falling. Chapter 5 Jack's eyes flew open. His heart raced. Overwhelming relief pulsed through him. He'd been spared. The landing he knew would shatter him into a million pieces never came. The first thing he registered when his heart rate slowed and his eyes would focus was one of the more disturbing sights he'd witnessed recently. Marin had her arm wrapped around Lachlan's shoulders as tears flowed freely down his face. Moved, upset, angered, Jack wasn't certain, but he was intensely uncomfortable witnessing such a private moment. Jack turned away and brushed the damp streaks from his own face. That was when he noticed they were parked outside the junk shop. No telling how long they'd been sitting in Marin's truck. Jack was just fine with that. They could sit in the truck all night, the neighbors be damned. When Lachlan eventually spoke, his voice was composed. Joshua, he was amused by your name for him. Joshua was trapped in the in-between a very long time ago. His entire self, physical body in essence. Without an anchor in a physical plane, he was stranded in the in-between. I don't know how. That wasn't clear. But only his essence, his anchor, traveled to our world, Jack said. So where is his body? Dead a long time now. Lachlan closed his eyes for a moment. It takes a long time for a dragon to starve. And in that environment, maybe longer. But I'm certain he starved. I shielded you from his hunger. Jack flashed to that moment of weightlessness when Lachlan had brought him back down into his own body. That train ride was Joshua's life. Jack shook his head. I'm not sure why I didn't see it. Maybe I was too wrapped up in the events and the feelings to process it all. With me as a psychic bridge, Joshua was able to convey a story. You provided the structure, Jack, and I benefited by watching it all. It had played in his mind as a journey, so what Lachlan said made sense. If he has no body, is he a ghost? Jack asked. But as soon as he asked the question, he knew that wasn't right. No, not a ghost. His body died, but trapped in the in-between. The entirety of him wasn't able to die. When his body failed, he was left only as essence. Unable to end his life, trapped in a wasteland, he simply continued. Lachlan's face tightened. He's not insane, more sane than any one of us, but desperate for peace. I don't understand how he was spared. He had no passage of time with which to ground himself, no companionship, no tactile experiences. But he escaped the fate of every dragon who chose to stay in this world, every dragon bred to this world. As Lachlan spoke, Jack started to get a sense of exactly what an ancient was to Lachlan and his people. Not a god, but maybe so far beyond one's own experience, so important to society, that he came close. A king? An emperor? Or maybe a wise man or a shaman? Lachlan sighed. He didn't mean to harm you or to frighten you. I know that now, Jack replied quietly. 
and I certainly understand his anger at being asked to return to what he would consider a prison. By a group of infants, no less, Lackland said. You do know what he wants, don't you? Jack hated to ask, because he already knew the answer. Lacklin nodded, and Jack's heart ached for the man. Marin looked between the two men. What? Is it that terrible? Jack responded, saving Lacklin from speaking the words. He wants to die. He wants us to help him find a way to end his life. Oh, Joshua. Marin drew a deep breath. But how? Lacklin said he needed some time to review the information and to think about their options. He wanted to reconvene in the morning to come up with a plan of action. Jack wasn't sure how he could be of any more help, but he'd do what he could. Having been exposed to the dragon's deepest, most intimate thoughts and feelings, Jack couldn't help but feel a profound connection with the ancient being. Chapter 6 The next morning, Jack, Marin, and Lacklin met at Jack's house for breakfast. Marin brought breakfast tacos, and Lacklin brought an insane idea. Reborn? Jack asked. What does that even mean? Lacklin's tacos were still wrapped in foil on his plate. You can't destroy a dragon's essence. Joshua hoped, in coming here... We would know how. But he couldn't have predicted how young the dragons are in this world. So if you can't destroy essence, you think it's okay to recycle it? Isn't essence a dragon's soul? Marin shook her head. No, essence isn't soul. It's essence, a snapshot of the dragon. Lacklin leaned his forearms on the edge of the kitchen table. Consider essence as a smaller, non-physical reflection of the whole. Pairing Joshua's bodiless essence with a new body lacking essence should remake that reflection in the image of the new owner. It's an end for Joshua, but the energy of his essence would go on in its new form. Again, destroying that energy is beyond our knowledge, so this is the only solution for Joshua. Jack had a bad feeling about this conversation. After chewing over Lacklin's explanation, Jack asked, And where does one shop for dragon bodies without their own essence? One doesn't. Lacklin shifted his weight further forward. Except for Joshua. I've never heard of one existing without the other. Temporary separation, but that's it. A dragon won't work because all dragons will have their own essence. No. Jack shook his head and kept shaking it. No way. Lacklin quirked an eyebrow. I haven't asked. You will, and the answer is no. I'm not asking, Lacklin said. Joshua is. Marin turned a narrow gaze on Lacklin. When did that happen? Last night. The rebirth of his essence through joining with another person was the only solution I could find for him, but I wasn't certain he'd agree, so I had to speak with him. A self-deprecating smile emerged on Lacklin's face. It took significant effort before Joshua would consider communicating with me. He has a strong connection with you, Jack, for whatever reason. He agreed. Jack couldn't believe what they were asking. He asked me to present the case to you, only because he sees it as his own death with no harm to you. The energy of his essence will continue, but it will be imprinted by you, Lackland said. Think of it like a sort of reincarnation, but with energy rather than soul. You don't know for sure that Joshua's imprint on his essence would be erased, do you? And even if it is, what would dragon essence do to a human? It has to have some effect on humans. Actually, Jack, it has been done. There's evidence in our mythology. Marin shot Lacklin a sidelong glance. From long ago in our history, 
when the relationship between humans and dragons was very different. Joshua and I discussed the mechanics. It's not only possible. He's seen it done. A very long time ago. But he has first-hand experience. Are you telling me it's safe? He directed the question to Marin, because he trusted her infinitely more than Lachlan in this scenario. Jack could only imagine the lengths Lachlan might go to appease or even preserve a sane ancient. But Marin... He knew Marin. They may not be close, but he knew her. If she thought it would kill him, she might let him do it. But she'd say it was dangerous. Lachlan, why don't you share the mechanics? Marin gave the old dragon a falsely sweet smile. It's simple in theory. Your body and his essence can join in the in-between. Either I or Marin open a door and carry you through. You merge with Joshua's essence, and he's finally at peace. Anything of him, his memories, his feelings, his experiences, are washed away. The sum of your being, memories, experiences, feelings, will be imprinted upon the essence energy. Then we bring you back. Jack narrowed his eyes. You're leaving something out. Yes, he is. Marin's voice was tinged with anger. We can carry you through, but I don't believe it's possible to hold on to you while you merge with Joshua. Am I right? Lachlan's lips thinned, and he nodded his head. Jack's brain was doing backflips trying to sort out how the process worked. And you're telling me that somehow I could take on that energy and it wouldn't change me? I find that hard to believe. You would change the essence, because it's merely a reflection of the sum of the body and mind. That energy was not intended to exist apart from a physical body. Lachlan sighed. To remove the metaphysical aspect, think of essence as an organ. It serves a function, but it's not intended to exist as a being on its own. But what will it do to me? Jack asked again. Surprisingly. It was Marin who answered. It might give you a longer life. Maybe make you more resistant to disease. Prop you up a little. But it can't give you something that's not already there. It's energy, not magic. And its function is to act as a non-physical receptacle. What if something goes wrong with the reset button and Joshua isn't washed away? Jack shook his head and held up his hands. You know what? Don't answer that. I don't care. I don't know why I'm even asking these questions. This idea is insane. I could disappear into... into the freaking in-between. I could be stuck, just like Joshua was. Very unlikely. I'll be there, and I won't lose you. Lachlan inched back, making an obvious effort to give Jack more space. Please consider it. You're the only option. Someone with magic wouldn't work. Something about the energy of a dragon's essence and the kernel of magic inside humans isn't compatible. And while Joshua is willing, he's only agreed to attempt the process with you. And that made Jack angry. He'd been inside Joshua's head, and Joshua had been inside his. Jack couldn't imagine an eternity of what Joshua had lived. It was unthinkable. But the solution was a no-win situation for Jack, a small chance that he'd end up lost in that same terrible place that had trapped Joshua in exchange for a good chance the Ancient would be able to rest at last. Jack gained nothing. Save the world, do the right thing, be selfless. His pulse thundered. What about him? Find someone else. Jack stood up and left the kitchen. His guests could find their own way out. Jack went to his room and dropped down on his bed. Fuck them and their ancients and their problems. He didn't particularly want to examine why the question made his blood boil. It was a question, and he could simply say no. He punched his pillow. It wasn't that simple. If he hadn't been Joshua, 
if only for a few snatches of time, it would be so much easier. Screw them. Jack rolled over on his side, planning to try catch up on a few more hours of sleep. He was so tired, yet as he lay there, sleep eluded him. He felt smothered by the weight of the ancient dragon's despair. The heaviness pressed down on his lungs until he felt like he couldn't breathe. The ache of a loneliness so dark and deep he felt he'd never see, touch, or hear another made his heart hurt. Damn you, Joshua. But Jack knew it was his memory and his conscience this time, not the dragon's telepathy, that wrapped around him and squeezed him until he wanted to scream. Bleary-eyed, Jack rolled out of bed a few hours later. He picked up his phone and tapped speed dial for Marin. We do it now. Meet me at the junk shop. What? Jack hung up on her. He couldn't live with the guilt. Knowing what he knew, feeling what he'd felt, he couldn't live with the guilt of not helping Joshua. And that son of a bitch had looked inside his head and counted on it. He sat down at the small desk in his room and hand-wrote a letter. It took him three tries, but he got it about right in the end. He sealed it in an envelope and addressed it simply to Kenna. He dropped it on his desk, there for anyone to find, if it came to that. He drove too fast on the way to the shop, and when he arrived, he slammed the door of his car shut. He was pissed, and he was damn well allowed to be. Marin and Lacklin were waiting in the shop for him, as was Joshua. Why? Lacklin began. None of your damn business. Jack tossed his car keys on the counter, and they landed with a loud rattle. I'll be exactly the same when we're done. He directed the statement to Marin, because he still didn't trust Lacklin's motivations. You don't have that kernel of magic that some humans have, and this won't change that lack. You'll be the same, no magic, no fire, Marin answered calmly. She looked worried. That made two of them. No strange cravings, nothing like that, and it'll just be me coming back. It wasn't really a question. Jack simply wanted to make sure he didn't come out of this thing and scare the crap out of himself. No strange cravings, and just you come back. Marin's gaze flickered back and forth between Jack and Lacklin. Lacklin needs to bring you through. You can create the door? After getting a quick nod from Lacklin, Marin said, Yes, I'll open the door. All right. Anything else I need to know to make sure this thing works? Jack asked. Your physical self has to merge with Joshua's essence. At first, that energy will still be Joshua. Only after you've combined will the essence rewrite itself in your image. You have to let that happen. Lacklin examined him. You have to be ready to make that choice, or it won't work. I'm ready. As the words left his mouth, Jack hoped that he was. Jack felt the moment Lacklin and he crossed the barrier into the in-between. None of the numbing cold he remembered, but the absolute stillness of the place and the warped sense of time was the same. Where had the wind come from that he'd seen through Joshua's eyes? A metaphor, perhaps? Jack lifted his hand. He couldn't see it, but he could feel that he'd moved it. It was an odd sensation but very different from his last experience in this place. Marin is still young. She wasn't able to protect your physical body as well as I am. Jack flinched at the voice in his head. Not too loud, but invasive in a way that Marin's mind speech hadn't been. He felt Joshua, and then he felt the cold. Lacklin had let him go. Jack was surrounded, engulfed, swallowed by Joshua. He pushed at Jack's very being. This wasn't a reset. He was being consumed. 
Panic flared as Jack saw himself disappearing into nothing, replaced by the great well of emotion that was Joshua. How could something, someone so old and so vast simply cease to be? No, this wouldn't work. Jack struggled. His body didn't function in this space. But he had will. Jack shoved back at the ancient presence with all of his will and met no resistance. Calm, still, cold, alone. His panic ebbed. In the stillness, Jack realized his error. For this to work, the two would have to coexist, completely share consciousness, in order for the reset to happen. Twined thoughts, but only for a moment. Could he? Cold and fear pushed, and his brain raced. One terrifying, powerless moment exchanged for an end to an ancient being's suffering, and a lifetime of guilt and regret if he refused to even attempt the trade. Jack sent a message to Joshua and hoped it carried through the ether. He couldn't form words, and he didn't know what else to do. The thick numbness he'd felt in place of his body faded, and he felt himself begin to float. Not an unpleasant feeling. But it only lasted an instant. Once again, Joshua surrounded him, anchoring him in space. And this time, when Jack felt that he was being swallowed whole, he counted backward from ten and tried his damnedest to believe that they were truly one, temporarily. Ten. Nine. Lachlan's flashing green dragon eyes looked down at Jack. You said you were ready to make the choice. Jack's teeth chattered. Holy shit, he was cold. And weak and sore. Like he had the flu. Someone had laid him out flat on the ground. I lied. The words brought forth a racking cough. Marin appeared with a blanket from his office. She threw it over him. You're a complete ass and an idiot. The worry and concern in her voice surprised him. He wasn't sure why. He'd worry about her, too, if she was stupid enough to teeter on the brink of oblivion and thumb her nose at it. I'm okay. Since his teeth chattered with the words, it seemed a stupid question. You'll be fine. Lachlan said. Eventually. Curling onto his side, Jack hugged the blanket close. Joshua? The tense lines of Lachlan's face eased. At peace. Jack nodded. He couldn't feel Joshua's presence, so he guessed Lachlan was right. Can I have a hot coffee? Marin laughed. Yeah, it's brewing now. Epilogue A few days later, Jack sat in his office contemplating the Jack and Joshua merger. He felt the same. No sudden urges to light up the furniture in a ball of fiery dragon flames. No shining green eyes. No sense of the magic that he knew was around him. In fact, no whiff of magical ability at all. Just as Lachlan and Marin had said. Jack was giving some thought to whether his unchanged state was something to celebrate or mourn, but mostly he was just avoiding doing the junk shop's accounting for the week. As he contemplated the pros and cons of having magic, of having his books up to date, of life in general, Bob trotted into the office. That was new. Hey, Bob. He kept the greeting casual because he didn't want to chase the little dude away. Bob paused briefly, but then continued along his path. He ended up next to one of the client chairs, then jumped with more agility than Jack would have suspected into the chair. I hope you're here to tell me your buddy's happy. Can't lie, the last few days have been rough. I'm not sure I'm up for another case so soon. Bob curled up into a ball and closed his eyes. 
Napping in the office must mean that Bob didn't have another case for him and was happy enough with the outcome of Nelson's. He went back to crunching numbers on his computer. As he was typing, he thought he might have heard a faint whisper. Happy. The End This has been Spirelli Paranormal Investigations, Episode 4, written by Kate Bure, narrated by Roberto Scarlato, copyright 2015 by Catherine G. Cobb, production copyright 2017 by Catherine G. Cobb.